Okay, so my name is Jared Hawley, and I'm a Max Weber postdoctoral research here at the EUI. Um, I'm Bruno Leipold, and I'm also a Max Weber fellow. And we're here welcoming Annalyn Dedane to talk to us tomorrow and, uh, and tomorrow after that, and this evening, um, about egalitarianism and republicanism. But, Annalyn, your first book was about liberalism in 19th century France, and so I thought we could start by asking you to describe the relationship between those two projects or those two interests. And so for a long time, political theorists and historians of political thought tended to emphasize an opposition between liberalism and republicanism. And as I understand it, you joined others in problematizing that binary view. But you did so in a really innovative and a celebrated way by unearthing a largely forgotten view of liberty and centralized state power that you called aristocratic liberalism. Mm -hmm. So what exactly is aristocratic liberalism, and how does your earlier work on it and liberalism relate to or inform your current project on republicanism and egalitarianism? Thank you so much, Jared, for that question, and also for uh, inviting me to be here. Um, I guess uh, one way of answering a question would be to say that my overarching research interest uh, since the beginning of my career has been in the history of freedom. Okay. Mm. Um, and uh, both my first book and my second book, uh, so I'm completing a, a, a larger project on the intellectual history of freedom from Herodotus to the present, are about changing, uh, tracing changing meanings of freedom over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the view I'm developing is that uh, freedom used to be uh, defined as a concept that was nearly identical with democracy. So in answer to the question, how can we be free? The answer for centuries used to be, uh, you can only be free in a uh, popularly self-governing state. Um, and my argument, uh, and that's an argument, um, I sort of started developing my first book and I'm sort of developing uh, uh, you know, from a broader perspective in my second book, is to say that that changed in the 19th century. Um, so what liberalism did as an intellectual movement, I argue, was to redefine the concept of freedom in an anti-democratic manner. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that explanation, that perhaps allows us to talk a little bit about the relationship between your historical work, again on the 19th century, but now it sounds intriguingly drawing back all the way to Herodotus, um, and your contemporary interventions in normative political theory. Right. So, what you did, as I understand again with aristocratic liberalism, was to unearth not simply a normative position, but an entire tradition of thinkers who held that position, or, mm -hmm. or something like right, it. Right. And so I wonder if you could reflect on the relationship between the historical dimension of your work and right. the normative dimension of your work both in general, but perhaps particularly with attention to this notion of tradition, and whether using the notion of tradition can help you to solve, or can help us, or can help others to solve some of the questions that come up when we try to relate historical arguments to contemporary political normative uh, arguments. Okay, again, that's a great thank you, uh, question, thank you so much. Uh, so I was, I was trained as a historian. Um, I did my uh, PhD in history. Um, I then spent a large amount of time in uh, various history departments, and I've always, uh, originally I've always thought of myself as a historian. So originally my interest in the history of ideas uh, was primarily to reconstruct these ideas. Okay. Um, and that made me um, be interested in particular in ideas that for some reason or another uh, are foreign to us. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I was interested um, in my first book in uh, reconstructing the history of a particular brand of 19th century liberalism mm -hmm. uh, that is in many ways completely alien uh, to us today um, because the 19th century liberals uh, that I was uh, interested in argued that um, you could only be free in a state in which um, um, in which you have economic inequality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so their argument was that in order to prevent um, sort of a, a bureaucratic colossus from forming itself, mm. ideally you should have um, uh, individuals that uh, in their own right were powerful enough to resist government. And my initial uh, interest in this way of thinking was simply to say, oh, this is bizarre. Uh, <laughs> why do people have these ideas? 
uh, how, how can we understand it? And that's, in my view, the main job of intellectual history, okay. to reconstruct ideas that are in many ways foreign to us. Mm. Uh, but then, um, um, in um, 2011, I was hired uh, by a political science department and I, um, I became a member of the political theory section. Mm -hmm. And um, in that environment, I started becoming more interested in more normative questions. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started uh, thinking, uh, well, uh, perhaps reconstructing a particular uh, way of thinking or a particular tradition, um, you know, why I stopped there, um, perhaps it would be more interesting to um, sort of develop to use my expertise in the history of ideas to start developing um, normative arguments of my own. Mm -hmm. And my main reason for doing so is that simply because my colleagues kept on asking me, <laughs> well, you know, this is, it's really interesting what you have to say about Montesquieu, but what can we do with this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, should we, should we take him seriously? Does he have something to say to us that is interesting or not? Uh, and that sort of stimulated me to, uh, to go beyond, uh, you know, that mere sort mm -hmm. of, um, 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 uh, attempt to reconstruct and to start thinking, you know, what, what, is, what is the normative option of what I'm doing? Yeah. Um, and your sort of um, introduction of the, the concept of a tradition, I think, um, has been helpful to me okay. um, in, in doing precisely that. Uh, because if you think about it, very few of us think about uh, normative questions in a vacuum. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually, we tend to place ourselves um, within a particular tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and there, I think my historical expertise can really help me to flesh out certain uh, normative aspects by saying, uh, well, you know, if you consider yourself to be, uh, let's say, a liberal, do you know what that implies? Do you know what the historical baggage of particular claims that, uh, you know, you sort of um, uh, seem to think um, are sort of, uh, you know, unquestionably true yeah. do you know uh, that what the genealogy of those particular claims uh, do you know uh, how they were developed um, and that I think um, very often will have uh, normative um, uh, consequences mm -hmm. so, so a question that springs to mind from that is um, how that like desire that push from these theorists to have a normative um, output to this historical study plays out in your new book um, and it was, if you, I mean, because you're doing a very long historical right, right, scale right. here. It was just always in right. the back of your mind. Each stage, you need to be telling people right. what is the value of that. Was right. that um, well, right. maybe right. we'll say something about that? Uh, okay, yeah, uh, great question. Thank you, mm -hmm. Bruno. Um, so, when I started writing my book on the, you know, sort of the longer term history of freedom, um, from Herodotus to the present, mm -hmm. again, my sort of original impetus was to, uh, was, you know, it started from a sort of historical curiosity. Um, I became interested in this um, you know, broad conceptual history of freedom in, when I was in the US. Uh, and I remember uh, I was at UC Berkeley at the time and I was on campus and there were um, some people, I don't know if they were students or not, but they had this sort of um, placard saying um, um, socialism is unfreedom uh, and it had a, a picture of Obama with a Hitler moustache. And that was so strange to me that they would associate Obama with Hitler. Uh, I, I thought that was so paradoxical. Mm -hmm. And also coming from a, uh, a European context, that slogan, socialism is unfreedom, just sounded very strange to me. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, I started thinking, well, you know, there's something interesting going on here. Um, how can people have such different uh, views on what freedom is? Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? Um, so in a way, my book is a... a you know, was sparked by, by a curiosity, um, a sort of a desire to, mm -hmm. you know, to place that particular um, definition of freedom mm -hmm. in a broader historical context. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I started realizing that, uh, that, that by writing this book, um, that would also allow me to make a more normative point in the sense that um, my book reconstructs a genealogy. Mm -hmm. um, um, and the whole point of the book is to argue uh, that those sort of definitions of freedom, uh, the identification of socialism with unfreedom, that that um, uh, is a, actually a very recent mm -hmm. uh, way of thinking about freedom, and that that ruptures uh, with centuries, mm -hmm. uh, with a centuries-long tradition mm -hmm. in which um, freedom was not seen as, uh, you know, it wasn't seen as identical with socialism either, but it definitely wasn't seen as contradictory with socialism. Mm -hmm. Um, um, uh, it was seen as uh, synonymous, or almost synonymous with democracy. Mm. 
Um, and uh, that was that remained true during the American and French revolutions. Mm -hmm. um, so what I describe in the chapter about the American and French revolutions uh, is that both the American and French revolutionaries believed uh, a that freedom was primarily about popular self-government and b that you needed material equality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, or at least a certain measure of it, uh, sure. material equality in order um, for those popular uh, governments to continue to exist. Mm -hmm. And it was only in the 19th century, I again argue, that uh, people started uh, redefining the concept of freedom and started saying, oh, there is actually an opposition between freedom and equality. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, uh, you know, in historical <coughs> terms, uh, yeah. relatively recent invention. Hmm. So it's quite a clear kind of political upshot of the project. Exactly, the exactly. Of showing like that, you know, right, exactly. well, things like socialism right, and right. drives towards greater equality are not this big opposition to... Exactly. Um, the, and I mean, so, you know, if you're an analytical philosopher, then you can simply, uh, you know, come back to me and say, well, you know, who cares? Uh, the question we should ask ourselves isn't what were people saying about freedom and the relationship between freedom and equality, you know, in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. We should think, think about this question for ourselves and uh, we should, you know, sort of um, come up with our own view on whether these two uh, principles um, are, you know, harmonious or not. Uh, but my, uh, you know, my sort of counter answer to that would be to say, well, that's simply not how people in the public sphere uh, think and, and talk. Mm -hmm. um, we like to place ourselves in uh, these longer term traditions uh, when we talk about normative stuff. So it matters to people yeah. to say, uh, no, you know, there isn't this sort of, um, uh, you know, like uh, a long term opposition between uh, liberty and equality it, it it really does it, it matters to people whether you can say that or not mm -hmm. mm. well i had a follow-up like kind of a uh, quite practical question which is you know um just like uh, you know doing such a large span of history must mm -hmm. have been really difficult getting yes. into all of those periods mm -hmm. in the yes. level of detail like you want me yes. to talk about what that must have been like well i mean here's my first you guys don't do this for a second <laughs> <laughs> it took me forever <laughs> So, uh, but otherwise, you know, it was, you know, there are a lot of uh, good things about it as well. Um, I really, really enjoyed doing it, and I think we need more of this. Okay, yeah. um, so there is sort of a, I'm not the only person doing this, obviously, mm -hmm. there's uh, a, a trend uh, among intellectual historians to mm -hmm. do uh, what David Armitage, uh, amongst mm -hmm. others, uh, has described as big intellectual history. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a way, it's sort of a reaction against sort of the, you know, the careful contextualism mm -hmm. Um, uh, that intellectual historians, uh, as, you know, saw as their sort of main goal um, since um, uh, about the 1960s. So um, I think there's sort of a, a swing of the pendulum uh, going back to these you know, bigger uh, attempts to trace, you know, mm -hmm. bigger um, uh, uh, histories of concepts uh, and of ideas more broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also, I mean, I really think that's what we should be doing in intellectual history mm -hmm. if we want to keep having a, an audience for mm. our ideas. I wanted to ask, which is kind of following up on some of the things you said without being too straightforward, I suppose, which is this concern with um, economic inequality as um, required for freedom in a certain line of argumentation that you were trying to push against. Right. Right. To now say, well, we need to understand and think afresh, it seems to us today, the relationship between a certain conception of liberty, or liberty in general, um, and economic equality, which you're doing now. And I wonder, to relate back to the question of the tradition, why do you think it is that we, that you have to be making that intervention now? As in, why do you think it is that neo-Republican political theory, perhaps, has neglected this, what I see you saying, as a very tight and necessary uh, relationship between their view of liberty as non domination mm -hmm. and this mm -hmm. amount of material inequality. Um, maybe you could say yeah. something about that. Yeah. Um, well, so uh, if I understand it correctly, your question is, um, why does this need to be set at all? Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of interest uh, in um, in the history of freedom and um, uh, people working from within the neo-republican tradition mm -hmm. have already uh, made this point that uh, freedom can be identified with popular uh, self-government. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what, what are you bringing to the table? Uh, is that your question? In a way I would invite you to articulate that for the 
others that are watching, I think that you are bringing something to the table that isn't there, so I don't want to be seen as pushing you that way. I wonder why you think it is the case that that opportunity okay. for you to make that intervention right. has arisen right. the way that it's arisen. Why have we left the economy out of the story right. right. would be right. another way of putting right. what I'm thinking. Indeed. Yeah. Um, well, so I think there's two reasons for that. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I think um, there's a sort of dominant uh, liberal tradition mm -hmm. which has really pushed the idea that freedom and equality, in a sense of material equality, so equality of goods mm -hmm. and property, uh, are um, incompatible uh, values, and if you want to promote the one, you'll be harming the other. Yeah. So that's sort of Berlinian yeah. liberalism. Yeah. Mm. Um, but obviously, I'm not the first person to criticize Berlinian liberalism and to say, you know, perhaps we should be looking at this other tradition uh, of thinking about freedom, uh, which um, most uh, theorists and intellectual historians call Republican. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'm building, an, you know, obviously I'm you know, sort of building on, on work done by these scholars, in particular Quentin Skinner and Philip Pettit. Mm -hmm. I do feel, however, uh, that both uh, Skinner and Pettit um, haven't paid as much attention uh, as the sources uh, warrant to the fact that uh, these Republican um, thinkers weren't just arguing if you want to be free, uh, you need to have institutions that allow uh, you know, the people to check uh, those who are governing, uh, so you need to create more accountable, more democratic regimes. But that they were also arguing uh, you need more, uh, you know, you need laws and institutions that will make sure that um, there won't be any rampant uh, economic inequality, because mm -hmm. if you have rampant economic inequality, uh, then um, uh, your uh, democratic uh, Republican government will end up sort of falling apart, either because it becomes an oligarchy or because it uh, ends up sort of, um, you know, uh, falling apart through a civil war. Um, and I think um, people like uh, Skinner and Penn haven't paid as much attention um, as they could have to that sort of argument within the Republican tradition, mm -hmm. because they were so intent on uh, differentiating Republicanism uh, from what you might call Aristotelianism. Uh, so from the argument that, um, um, uh, uh, you know, um, being free um, doesn't, isn't about non-domination, uh, but it's about uh, living a particular way of life, uh, and that hence the state uh, can set you free by forcing you to follow that particular way of life. So that tradition, uh, so if you uh, look at um, both uh, Skinner's and Pettit's work, they've both uh, made it very clear uh, uh, that uh, the republicanism they're interested in is very different from that Aristotelian concept. Mm, yeah. And I think there's sort of a, an unacknowledged assumption that arguments uh, for um, redistribution and mm. for uh, enhancing uh, inequality, uh, equality, I'm sorry, um, you know, is something that fits into that Aristotelian tradition mm. rather than the, into the republican tradition that um, uh, scholars like Skinner and Pettit were interested in. Okay. So I think it's mm -hmm. sort of a a desire to dissociate uh, republicanism from Aristotelianism. Yes, okay. Yeah. And it's also very obvious if you, uh, to my uh, knowledge, um, uh, the, um, the scholar who's done most uh, work on uh, the history uh, of sort of this push for uh, material uh, equality within the republican tradition is Eric Nelson. Mm -hmm. uh, and he reads this as being part of an Aristotelian tradition rather than from the uh, neo Roman uh, tradition. Yeah. Which is a view that I disagree with. Okay. I mean, one of the interesting things about the um, paper that you're going to be presenting tomorrow, or something like, like, is that I mean, one way you can go down is to criticize republicanism for just le uh, leaving out the economy. Mm -hmm. But what you're doing is actually just saying, well, actually, if we go back to mm -hmm. a lot of these republican mm -hmm. organs, the economy is there. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And that's very much so. Yeah. Very much yeah. so. If you, I mean, it is actually surprising that there hasn't been paid more attention to this because if you read Harrington and everybody agrees Harrington is sort of, you know, the farming father. Of Republicanism in many ways, um, I mean, definitely on a, you know, on a par with Machiavelli. Mm -hmm. You know, he's very explicit about this. Mm -hmm. um, his argument is that you need uh, two things, you know, uh, you need rotation, uh, which means uh, an accountable government, but you also need an agrarian law, mm -hmm. uh, which is laws that are uh, instituted to, to redistribute economic wealth uh, among uh, all the individuals in society. Mm -hmm. So in this way, it sounds like what you're offering, in one sense, is an internal criticism of neo-republicanism by taking right. on right. many of their own positions, but also their own methodology in some sense as well, right? Um, to go back and read the texts 
Right, right. I mean, yeah, so, uh, you know, neo-Republicans are very explicit about the fact that they want to place themselves mm -hmm. into a particular tradition, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that they don't want to reinvent the wheel, so to speak, uh, you know, but surprisingly, um, you know, they haven't paid that much attention to this particular uh, aspect of their own um, uh, intellectual tradition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a nice place to end it, unless we've got any further follow-up. I think that was most of what I wanted to ask, and a good introduction, I think, for the talk coming up in a couple of hours, yes. and then tomorrow, yeah. Great. So well, just thank you, you again. For yeah, thanks so much. Yeah.